All right, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome from Columbia University in the city of New York. My name is Elisa Douglas, director of the Columbia Alumni Association Regional Clubs and Alumni Relations. Thank you so much for joining us for our annual tradition called Columbia Connects. Connects programming brings Columbia alumni together for fellowship, networking, and to welcome new graduates into our alumni community. For the first time this year, we are including a number of virtual sessions for our alumni around the world to connect in an engaging and interesting way. With that said, we are so excited today to have you join us for our virtual talk with Professor Cheryl Strauss-Einhorn. Her talk will be on No Regrets, How to Make Big Decisions Better. Our talk today will include a presentation from Professor Strauss-Einhorn for 20 minutes. It will be then followed by a Q&A session. Professor Strauss-Einhorn would like to have a live Q&A and we ask that participants put their questions in our chat bar function. And then if time permits, she will turn it over to previously submitted questions. I would now like to introduce our speaker. Cheryl Strauss Einhorn is a graduate from the class of 1992 from Columbia School of Journalism. She is the creator of the area method, a decision making system to solve complex problems. She has authored two books that address the topic. First called Problem Solved about personal and professional decision making and the newly released Investing in Financial Research which is about financial and investment decisions. She is also an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School and the founder of two firms, CFC Partners, which is a, culti a, co a coaching and consulting firm, pardon, and Decisive, an education technology firm. She has won several journalism awards for her investigative reporting and news stories. To learn more about Cheryl, we encourage you to please watch her TED Talk and also visit areamethod.com. Hi. Well, first, I'm so honored to be here today. Columbia is so very important to me. I feel so lucky to be a graduate of the journalism school, and I've been teaching here since 2008, first back at the graduate school of journalism, and then I added on the business school back in 2010. So I'm now going to take you through a presentation. And now can everybody see the presentation? Hold on. There we go. All right. I hope we have up the first slide. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about my decision making system. Oh, there we go. I hope that that is better for everybody. We're going to talk today a little bit about my decision making system, which is called the area method. I'm going to begin with a short story. I'm going to explain what the area method is in my work. And then I'm going to close with a few testimonials about the impact of area. I'm very fortunate that area is being used in a variety of ways across broad domains these days. Um, it's being used in low income high schools where a student used the system to decide whether he could live with his mother. Multinational companies like Goldman Sachs, where I did a workshop with merchant bankers to consider committing the company's capital. I've also been using it in my work with the State Department, where I worked with a group of foreign counterterrorism professionals to use it to consider how to build trust between disparate factions and then at graduate schools such as here at Columbia Business School, where I teach students how to evaluate investment opportunities and at Cornell's new technology campus where I use it to help startup companies thinking about developing their minimum viable product and also to evaluate their market opportunities. So first, let's start on my story. One day when I was a young girl, my mother went to a department store makeup counter to get her makeup done. And when she returned, she asked my father how she looked. And he replied, dear, when I look at you, I see my fantasy, not the makeup that you're wearing. And my mother got angry. Did this mean that my father didn't really see her? 
but even as a little girl, I knew that it meant that he saw her perfectly. But what it illustrates and what you see on this slide is that we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. And that means that we assign feeling and meaning to our interactions that can make an interpretation of events not only incorrect, but it can mean that we're in a moment with somebody big or small or even over a prolonged period. And although we're together, it may mean that we're having totally different experiences. Now, it's one thing when my mom wants to look and feel pretty, but it can be downright dangerous when we're sizing up a situation where being on the same page and really connecting with someone or with our team is critical. When the conversation is urgent and the outcome may make or break trust and impact the well being of our companies, our communities, and potentially even our country. And so this raises two questions, and you can see them here. How do we first ensure that we're exercising and organize an effective research and data collection system? And then second, how can we overlay a thinking system on top that lifts the veneer of cognitive bias that impairs our ability to gain new information and insight? So I began thinking about this because of my background as an investigative journalist. I was writing stories that had a big impact. This is a headline of a story that I wrote for Foreign Policy magazine called Can You Fight Poverty with a Five Star Hotel? It was an investigation I did into the World Bank's investment arm that I found instead of actually fighting poverty, seemed to be making investments that was not aligned with that critical mission and instead was handing out billions in loans to wealthy individuals and companies in some of the world's poorest places. And knowing that this particular story and other stories that I was writing was having a big impact, I just began thinking about how can I have a better sense of what kind of thinking mistakes I'm making? And how can I manage for my own assumptions and judgments and my biases? Could I put together, given my background in research, a system that thinks about the incentives and motives of other stakeholders involved in my story and have a way to better check and challenge these assumptions so that I could really more holistically solve my problems and allow for new information and insight to take hold? And as I was thinking about this, I thought, it's hubris to say I can look at a data set and all of a sudden say that I'm going to be objective. And so given this background that I have in research, I thought, well, what if I just invert that idea? What if instead of saying I'm going to try to be objective, I go all in on the idea that I'm a flawed thinker? Could I then set up a construct that could control for and counteract some of my thinking flaws? And so what I settled on is this idea of a new research process that could help me navigate my gray areas and avoid some of these mental shortcuts that enable us to make small decisions well, but that impede our ability to make big decisions. And I wrote about these two, I, I put them together in the two different books that I wrote. First, Problem Solve, which is on personal and professional complex problem solving. And then this spring in the newly released Investing in Financial Research, which I've been using at Columbia Business School. And both of them outline my area method. So let me take you through what is area. So area is an acronym for the steps of my perspective taking process that controls for bias, focuses on the incentives of others, and expands our knowledge while improving our judgment. So the first thing is why perspective taking? It's because it gives you a beautiful two for one. By walking in the footsteps of other stakeholders involved in your decision, you not only better understand their incentives and motives, but you also have an opportunity to gain distance on yourself, and that enables you to better bubble up assumptions and judgments that you might be making. And so how does area work? I'm gonna show you two visual maps because most of us um, process information visually. And so the first one shows you how the system fits together. And it shows you that not all investigations are linear, nor should they be. At times you need to be driven back into part or all of the process. And so you start at the bottom in absolute and you work your way up to analysis so that you're moving your work from bias to objectivity. And so area fundamentally recognizes that all information is tainted by where it comes from. 
and that if we separate out our sources of information and we look at them one at a time, we can better evaluate them. I like to say that it's the opposite of Google. Normally when we're solving a problem, we type something into the Google search engine, but then immediately we're in all perspectives at once. It's not only that we can't listen to our own inner voice, it's that we tend to listen to the loudest voices, those that come up first and without any sense of their incentives and motives. And so the letters of area stand for, as you see here, absolute relative, the E's are exploration and exploitation and analysis. So the first A, absolute, is primary source information from close up on the target of your decision, uninfluenced by outside sources. So let's say you're making a decision about funding the World Bank. The World Bank would be your target. How have they done in the past? What's their return on investment? And when you see what they fund, how do you feel about it? Do you agree with it? Then the next concentric circle relative, these are sources around your research subject. So think of them like secondary or tertiary sources. And here relative sources might be, for instance, the watchdog groups that monitor the bank spending. It might be those group that benefit from the bank. It might be academic reports and maybe a review of how decisions have been made in the past to fund the bank by regulators and at what level. The E's in area are exploration and exploitation, and I call them the twin engines of creativity because they're about getting beyond document-based sources to upgrade your research. Exploration asks you to listen to the perspectives of other people, and this really uses my investigative journalism background. It's about identifying good prospects and then asking them great questions. So here you might talk to people who had worked at the bank previously, who work at the bank now, who have received funding from the bank, watchdog groups that criticize the bank, regulators who have overseen the way that the bank conducts its activities and so on. And then in exploitation, this is a step that I think really has been missing from decision making. And it turns its lens inward on ourselves as decision makers, where I give you a couple of creative exercises that I've learned from experts in other fields, such as investigative journalism or the intelligence community so you can really look at your assumptions against the evidence that you've gathered and then the final a analysis cobbles all the disparate pieces of your work back together to help you come to conviction so the result as you can see from the example that i'm going to take you through is that what area does is it marries together the social performance side of human behavior with the analytics of decision making we don't operate in a vacuum, but we do tend to make decisions alone. And by trying to incorporate the perspectives of the other stakeholders, we have a better opportunity to holistically solve our problems and to be bought in by the other people who are going to help us make that decision successful after we've determined the outcome. This is the second visual map of area, and it just gives you an opportunity to see what is, once you're in the system, what does it look like? So within each of the steps, the A, the R, the E's, and the A, there are different individual parts to the research process. And when we think of innovation, we generally tend to think of a product like an iPhone, let's say, or a Tesla. But thinking systems can be innovations too. And the idea, the reason why I felt like we needed a new research and decision-making system is because we now better understand that we are all laden with these thinking flaws, that we need them to have in our minds, these kind of shortcuts that tell us the best way to get to work or where in the supermarket the aisle for the milk is and so on, so that we can just get on with our day, but that we also need a way to change how we interact with information and with other people to wash away some of this distortion that we've caked on over time and that can increase our risk of making a poor decision. There's one other update that I want to discuss to the research and pedagogy related to decision making. And that is this idea that generally with complex problem solving, many people find it off-putting. Where do they start to look? And there's so much information. Which information sources might be the best place to go to and in what order? And so what Aria says is, don't worry about that as well invert that problem and instead ask yourself something that I think is far more empowering 
and that you can answer without having solved the issue, which is what I call your vision of success. And this is the question that it addresses. What has to happen in the outcome of the decision for you to know that that decision has succeeded for you or your organization uniquely? Now, without even knowing what you're actually going to decide, you probably can answer that. And then that becomes your vision of success. And from there, you can derive what I call your critical concepts, the one, two, or three things that you need to deeply and creatively investigate to get to that vision of success. So now you no longer have something that is open-ended and potentially frustrating in terms of a research and decision-making process, but instead you have something that is targeted and focused on what you deemed must happen in the outcome of the decision for you to know that it has succeeded for you or your organization. So how does it work in practice? I thought it might be fun to talk about an example from a wine import and distribution company that I worked with not too long ago. The company was having flagging sales. Here was their decision problem. And they needed to figure out a way to motivate the executive and the sales team and how to create buy-in. And what the CEO came to me with is, look, we've never had an incentive compensation plan. And I'd like to think about instituting one, but that could be very off-putting. People really care about what are the metrics used to determine how they get paid and at what level. And so he had a situation that was open-ended, that had a very high emotional content to it. And we talked about how it was that he could use area to engage with solving this problem. So he wanted to solve the problem in three ways. He wanted to change compensation. He wanted to keep his existing team and get them bought in. And then he wanted to identify the right performance metrics to be able to achieve one and two, changing the compensation and getting the team to be bought in. So here's the classic decision problem setup. How are you going to change compensation plans? And that's open-ended. And then the inversion that area uses with the vision of success. How do I know that the decision to change the compensation plan has succeeded? That's practical and actionable. And then the critical concepts that the CEO derived, the top three things that he needed to deeply and creatively investigate to get to that vision of success was that he wanted to grow sales and profits by a certain amount, TK percent. He wanted to not only retain talent, but be able to attract new talent. And then he wanted to tie the pay to the performance net metrics to achieve those two things. So in the first A, absolute, this is information that represents the perspective closest to the entity or the entities at the core of your decision, primary source information. So for our CEO, his company was privately held, but he knew that there were publicly traded companies that were comparable in terms of their size and their revenue. And so he thought about the idea that he could look at some publicly traded companies and you see them listed here. And he could then from there go into their proxy statement, which is where companies disclose what is executive compensation look like and also where they explain the rationale for that compensation. And he could just see what's out there. What are companies in my industry of similar size doing? And right away, what he was able to see was that there's many different kinds. There's performance-based, non-performance-based, some that basically award equity and some that award cash. And he thought about, what do I like from these plans that are similar? And he thought he liked the long-term lockup, the fact that it is not based on one year's performance metrics, but three. He liked things that tended to be aligned more broadly with shareholders and that he liked metrics that seem to incentivize value related to the company's growth. In the next step in relative, you move outside of the absolute target and you look at secondary and tertiary information. And so here one step is an industry map. And so we had a chance to put his information into a broader context and to vet the information. Okay, so now he knew what his industry was doing in terms of incentive compensation, but is that good or bad? And how would he know? So by mapping it within the broader industry, he could see, do these companies fit the norm? And if not, and then with a look at 
the broader industry, he was able to see even what his industry doing, there's many more different options and that there's no one right way to construct an incentive compensation plan. And he was able to see that com some companies use revenue and some companies use return on investment and some award high equity comp versus cash comp and that there's many different ways to look at it. And from here, staying in relative, he also did a literature review to find out, well, so, so what? What are best practices in incentive compensation? And here he was able to look at articles from journals like the Harvard Business Review, but also from industry publications that specifically focus on compensation. And that's what exactly is. And also academic journals. How do they think about what is good governance in today's world when you're constructing an incentive compensation plan? And then moving beyond documents, once the CEO got into exploration, he used my interview formula, GP plus GQ equals IQ. Good prospects, the right people, plus great questions, give you your interview quality. And this was an opportunity then to use what he learned from documents to actually talk to people and to be able to better understand, well, I read about what your company does, but what's worked and what hasn't? What motivates a sales team? What tends to turn people off? What could skew behavior in a way that might make people uncomfortable? And so the CEO had an opportunity to interview lots of different people to better understand the information that he gathered from documents. Then in exploitation, he used some of the creative exercises that I've outlined. One of them has a complicated name. It's a very simple concept. And here you can see that it's called the competing alternative hypothesis exercise. So here's your opportunity to turn your lens inward on yourself, to look at your own assumptions and judgments and how they may be clouding, how you think about the diagnosticity of the evidence that you're collecting. And so the competing alternative hypothesis exercise simply says, look at all the different hypotheses that you have and line them up against your evidence. And here it focuses instead of on confirming data, on disconfirming data. A lot of times we can have a favorite hypothesis, but if we have a lot of confirming data, but one insurmountable hurdle, that hypothesis is gonna fail. So what this focuses on is which hypothesis has the least disconfirming data, and it's a more rigorous way to think about understanding what we've collected and how we wanna value the pieces of data that we've found. And then the, in the final step in analysis, this is where you have a pretty good idea of what you think you're gonna decide. And it says, okay, now try one more exercise to think about how your decision might fail. And here I recommend something called the pre-mortem. Many of you might be familiar with the post-mortem where the joke is everybody benefits but the patient. It's the autopsy and the patient has died. But here, before you make your decision, you have an opportunity to say, okay, I've picked my incentive compensation plan for this CEO and I can see that it's failed and how did it fail? And the pre-mortem says, tell the story of the failure. So you step by step write out how you could see that decision fail so that you can not only identify weaknesses in your plan, but you have an opportunity to set up safeguards to prevent the plan from failing in that way. So in exploitation, our CEO realized that as he was going through the process, he'd been very focused on these long-term metrics and he realized that he didn't have something that could really help a frontline sales team notice what was happening real time and still be able to make accommodations and to get paid, for instance, for switching what they were doing and for reporting problems that they might be seeing. And so that exploitation work drove the CEO back into earlier steps to see if he could locate more frontline metrics in addition to long-term metrics so that he could satisfy both parties, frontline salespeople, as well as his senior executive team. And that exploitation step does tend to be a game changer for so many people. So that by the time that he did this pre-mortem, he really was feeling ever more comfortable with what it was that he was concluding. And so what you can see 
in the final analysis is that what area gives you is this beautiful audit trail. We, we audit our finances every year, but we don't really audit our decision making. And I think that area gives us a nice way to do it because it gives you a defined sense of excess and critical concepts. It gives you organized research and evidence collection steps to go through that are built on this collaborative backbone of the perspective taking. It also then can help you record your work and your thinking through absolute relative and exploration. You can show that you've tested your assumptions with evidence in the exploitation phase, and then you've thought even then, how could your decision fail in analysis and how you came to conviction. And so when the CEO was able to finally sit down with his executive team, not only did he have a written journal of his work and his thinking showing the perspective taking and the empathy that he'd used to consider the needs of others, he also had something that could work as a discussion document that could take down the emotional quotient of a decision like this that shows that he challenged his assumptions and biases and he could invite other people in to understand what he had done and why. And he also had an objective measurement of his success that would hold him accountable to not having evolving hypotheses later on. So he had all the steps to bring his staff along in a transparent way so that they could feel included and respond to his inquiry. So I hope you can see from this brief presentation that there are several updates to the decision-making research and pedagogy. One that area recognizes that research is fundamental to decision-making and yet to date there are no other systems that understand that research is actually an umbrella term for a whole series of tricky steps that need to be thoughtfully and carefully navigated and that area holds your hand through it so you can follow a logical progression that it uniquely controls for and counteracts cognitive bias, that it gives you investigative resources and tips and techniques to upgrade your research and analysis, exercises to foster creativity and lead to originality, and finally, a sequence and framework that can bring these disparate pieces back together to build your own confidence and conviction in your decision and your ability to be a complex problem solver. So thank you, and I hope now that I have an opportunity to answer some of your questions related to decision making, and that you can follow up with me by visiting my website at areamethod.com and contacting me directly as well after this presentation. Thank you. And at this time, we'd now like to open up for live Q&A. So if you would go ahead and type your questions in the chat bar. Let's open up for Q&A. So we'll give you a minute or two And we'll look and see what questions come in and take those from here. Okay, should we just start with the first one that's come up, Elisa? Should I just read yes. the question for everybody? Well, first, David, thank you so much for your question. David's question is, I am chair of a nonprofit that gives grants. How can we improve our decision process on grants? The grants are for biomedical research and our process is similar to the National Institutes of Health. David, that is a terrific question and I have worked with many nonprofits. Um, I think that nonprofit leadership is a very rich stakeholder environment. You have many people who you need to answer to, not only the group that works with you immediately, but obviously also your board, as well as the people who donate money and, um, and the group that receives money um, from the good work that you're doing. And so I think area is actually uniquely set up for that. In my first book, Problem Solved, I follow four high stakes decisions, two high stakes professional decisions and two high stakes 
personal decisions. And one of the main decisions that I go through is of a nonprofit leader who operates a basic healthcare charity in Nepal. And he had originally come to me um, because he had actually gone to school with one of my former students who I taught at Columbia Business School here. And this um, CEO and founder of this nonprofit wanted to very quickly expand his charity. And the day after he reached out to me, the devastating earthquake hit Nepal that killed 10,000 people. And all of a sudden he had this very volatile backdrop where he was going to be operating in a country that was so very different from the one he'd be operating in just a day before. And he all of a sudden needed the solution yesterday, so to speak, to be able to very quickly expand his basic healthcare charity to deliver care to so many more in need. And so the book follows how did he very quickly go through the steps of area to be able to think from all the different stakeholder perspectives. In a country like Nepal, this was so very important because there was tremendous distrust between the Nepalese population and the government. And as you know, healthcare is the intersection of those two groups. Um, and also a third group because of, um, of the way that we have private um, healthcare options here in this country. And so basically taking your decision problem, whatever it is, and thinking about how you can look from each stakeholder perspective just reading through Problem Solve will show you how this nonprofit leader did it to be able to identify his critical concepts and then be able to go through the process quickly and to meet you where you are in terms of your needs. So I hope that you will give it a try and, and think about what is it in terms of the decision process for grants that can help you be more effective and efficient and create better buy-in? I know that for this CEO of the ODA Foundation, after we finished the process, because Area had helped him to better articulate his goals and he was able to have that Area audit trail, he was much more quickly able to increase his fundraising in a way that he had never been able to because he could articulate what his goals were, how he went through the process, and why he was confident that his expansion plan could better serve the population of Nepal. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Are there any additional live questions? If so, please go ahead and take a moment and type them in the chat bar. Sure, shall, shall we go ahead and take one of our previously submitted questions? Sure, but you know what? Well, a new one just came up, Elisa, so I'm going to read this from Aaron. Thank you so much, Aaron. It says, thank you for this informative insight. Do you have tips for introducing your area method into more traditional corporate and governmental leadership structures who may be entrenched in more top-down pyramidal decision-making processes? I work as a communications consultant with a focus on cultural diplomacy. What a great thing to be doing. And we find some pushback in introducing new methods of leadership and communications. Well, thank you so much for that excellent question. I would say yes. Um, not only do I offer coaching and consulting for organizations directly, um, but I think one of the best ways to introduce new methodology, and I am happy to always train people in being area certified as well, and I offer workshops and so on, is um, to actually be able to give them something that shows some of the results of the work. And so with what I do, I find that it is very important to evaluate the efficacy of the work. And so I have impact reports that I write, um, both where I do intake evaluations related to decision making and research and perspective taking and empathy and so on at the beginning at the outset to get a baseline before I start with organizations and then again after the work has been completed and I'm happy to share some of those impact reports because I, I think that 
showing people how it's worked out elsewhere and how it moves the needle in terms of decision making and improving productivity and teamwork is something that can really help have um, confidence and conviction for HR people and for companies to bring in some new ideas and methodology. So I hope that that is a, a, a useful um, answer to what you've asked and I appreciate the question. Thank you. Any additional questions? We'd love to answer them now live. All right, we have a question from Vladimir. I don't see it, so hold on one second. Hi, Vladimir. It says, do you see any limitation for applying your model? Thank you for asking that. Okay, so I would describe a limitation, and here's the limitation. Um, Area is really meant for high stakes decisions. So let me define high stakes. I define high stakes in three ways. First, it should be a problem where the outcome is uncertain. Number two, it should be a problem where it's gonna have a long-term impact on you or your organization. And third, it should be a problem where the price for getting it wrong could be costly for you or your organization. You don't really want it necessarily on you know, how to, how to take a different route to work, right? You want your cognitive biases to help you simply get through your day for a lot of the things that you do. If we didn't have these biases, when you walk into a supermarket, for instance, every time would be the first time because it would meant that you had no memory of what you've done before. But when it comes to high stakes problem solving, you deserve time and attention to invest in yourself, or to make the investment for your organization and getting it right, that's when I would apply a system like AREA. And that being said, although there are many steps that I outline in both of my books, what I would say is that AREA is meant to work for you where you are. I talk about taking strategic stops because I think that decision making to date doesn't really pay enough homage to our scarce resource of time. And so what AREA says is, Put in what I call a cheetah pause after you do each part of the process. So what is a cheetah pause and why the cheetah? The cheetah's hunting skill is not its ability to accelerate like a race car. It's actually that it decelerates up to nine miles an hour in a single stride. And that is far more powerful than the acceleration because now you're building in agility, flexibility, and maneuverability. And that's what you need in a quality research and decision-making system. So every time I suggest a pause in your work, I tell you to take a cheetah pause and I have what I call a cheetah sheet. Think of these as tips and techniques for places to look for good information based on where you are in the process, questions to ask of the data that you're collecting, analysis that you might wanna do at this juncture of your work. And so this idea of the cheetah sheet also gives you the opportunity long after you've read the books the first time to simply flip to the sections where you might want to upgrade your research and do something new and try a cheetah sheet so that you don't have to do everything. If you have enough time, that's great. The books show you how the steps fit together, but if you only have a little bit of time and you just want to try something new that still upgrades your research and your process and using these sheets can tell you where to look for information what questions to ask or what analysis to do. Do we have any additional questions? We'd love to take your live questions now while we have Cheryl with us. I see we do have a second question from David SoCal. Um, he's asking, might you give a reduced rate for nonprofits on your book? Um, David, reach out to me and let's talk about that. <laughs> Certainly, I do understand. I do a lot of work with schools as well, and I do understand those special constraints. Actually, my 
education technology company called Decisive is an approved vendor for the Department of Education for New York City public schools to help teach decision making as part of their college and career access program. And so I do think that, and I am very happy to offer um, some special accommodations. Um, and, um, and I appreciate the question, thank you. Sorry, David would like to rephrase that. He's mentioning consulting and workshop opportunities. But David, um, I think you can connect with Cheryl and she'll be happy to provide you with more details. Great, should we pick a question, Elisa, from the previously submitted? Yes. First, I just wanna to say to the Columbia Alumni Network, these are great questions. All of them are terrific. So I apologize if we only get to a few of them. Um, I really loved this particular question. It says, have morality and ethics ever truly played a role in decision making? This person asked about it vis-a-vis -vis world leaders. I can't speak to world leaders, but what I wanna say is that morality and ethics are central to the area method. This idea of understanding that all stakeholders have a value and understanding that we want to pay homage to that and to better understand each other and that our decisions can fundamentally strengthen our relationships, that's at the center of area. If we can't communicate effectively with one another, we can't solve any of the world's problems. And so understanding and sitting in the perspectives of others, I think is one of the best ways where we can have an opportunity to have similar conversations and to try to solve our problems holistically. So that's how I would answer that question. And then I also liked this question about how does your journalism background inform your work? I would say that it's absolutely fundamental. I initially didn't realize why I got interested in journalism. I thought that it was because I like to research and write. I love to talk to people and hear their stories and I didn't wanna sit behind a desk. But I think especially as I was writing Problem Solved, what I realized is I have a very shy father and my dad is a professor and a researcher. And in order to get to know him, I realized I was gonna to need to ask him questions. And so this idea about identifying the right question and making it inclusive so somebody can enter into it and to be part of the part of the conversation is again central to area. And in this exploration chapter, I really give you everything that I've learned as a journalist. What are the different types of questions, knowledge questions, opinion questions, information questions, situational questions, and how do you ask them so that you're not asking them to ask them. You're asking them to get actionable and practical information that moves your decision making process forward. So those are two of them. Do we have time for one more, Elisa? Yes, we can take one more. Okay, so I really wanted to address this one because um, somebody put at the moment, I'm struggling with the decision of whether my question sounds stupid or not. And look, I think that giving ourselves confidence and conviction that we all can be improved decision makers and that we can do it in a way that strengthens our relationships, that's something that builds resiliency. It's something that enables us to feel that we are then capable of taking on ever bigger challenges. And that was actually one of the most gratifying findings out of my high school program that targets under-resourced schools in particular. And so this idea of whether your question sounding stupid, I would, I would first of all hope that you give yourself an opportunity to know that by you asking questions that you're trying to include other people, that that's beautiful, that that's inclusive. And hopefully you can find also that the exploration chapter in Problem Solved or in Investing in Financial Research, because the books are set up the same way, even though they discuss different topics, so that you would find the process welcoming and familiar that it would give you an opportunity to feel like you ask good questions that deserve an opportunity to be at any table 
in any decision making process. So I really want to thank Columbia for inviting me today. I hope that people will reach out to me to Cheryl at AreaMethod.com and to visit my website to read more about my work. And, um, and thank you so much for including me today. Thank you so much, Professor Strauss Einhorn, for that thought-provoking talk. We're so grateful for your time today. So I want to now thank each and every one of our viewers who have joined us today. Um, I also would like to share on our upcoming Columbia Connects programs. Virtually, we have two programs taking place tonight at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. They are on virtual networking for arts professionals and virtual networking for real estate professionals. Tomorrow, we'll conclude with our final virtual program, which will be held at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that will be a talk with the legendary Professor Ken Jackson. He'll be talking with us about the roller coaster of New York and New York's history, the rise, decline, and rise again. And then for those of you that are local in New York City or in the tri-state area, we'd love for you to join us at our Columbia Connects program in person. This is our annual New York City-based event, and it's going to be held Tuesday, November 12th from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will take place at the Time Warner Building in Ascent Lounge. For all our upcoming Columbia Connects programs, please visit columbiaconnects.alumni.columbia.edu. Lastly, we want to hear from you, our viewers. Please do take a moment after this program concludes to complete the short post-talk survey. Your feedback is truly invaluable to us, and we thank you all and hope that we'll see you and that you'll join us again soon. Take care. <laughs>